couple of things to talk about. First off, we got uh, the new date of the work trip that's headed off to Really Recovered, June 4th and 5th. It's the correct date. It's in your bulletin. Uh, Chet Underwood's phone number's in there. If you want to join us to do uh, dry, putting up drywall or whatever else they ask us to do, we'll have uh, adults work in there. We'll have uh, kids work in there. So uh, even if you don't think you have lots of skill, come anyway, and we will find things for you to do, and you can make a difference over there. Uh, uh, second thing... Uh, Emma Zemantic is graduating from Northwestern High School. There's an a invitation to come out to her gathering. Um, if you RSVP using the number in the bulletin, you will surprise whoever's at the other end because it won't be her mother, Lisa. Uh, so if you're going to RSVP, you have two options. You can take the... Uh, uh, take the... Uh, let's see, how do I want to say this? The... 210 part of the phone number and make it a 201. Those numbers were transposed. Uh, so that's an option. Or you can look over at the announcement about the adult Sunday school class that's going to start and her dad starting it and his phone number's in here and it's correct. So you can call him. So you can flood Joe with yeses or you can fix the number or call the other number and surprise him or do all three. I don't care. Uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be good. So uh, just be aware of those. A new adult Sunday school class getting rolling at the 10 o'clock hour. Uh, Joe's getting that started. So if you're interested in that, you can take a look there. Uh, finally, a little bit of an extended uh, moment here. Um, I, I just, uh, just to be honest, um, not that I'd lie, but just to be honest, um, masks have been an immense irritant to me. Um, yeah, for reasons other than what you're thinking, probably. What I've watched is that it's, it's the whole thing has divided families. I've heard about family arguments and... Uh, divisions in families over this. Uh, it's been a wedge in churches. 
and all of that. Um, as you know, we've sort of followed along with the governor's uh, mandate. So when we could say, hey, we encourage mass, that's what we did at the beginning, and then they said, no, you need to require them, so we shifted to require, that's what we've been doing. And, uh, and I wanna thank all of you for uh, participating and complying with that. Uh, that's been really good for our people, people who feel vulnerable, who know that when they come, the vast majority of people here are gonna wear masks. And, and even knowing that some of, the, some of us wearing them don't think they're effective, but we're wearing them to benefit others, I think that's a beautiful thing and a great statement you've been making for months. So I applaud you for that and appreciate it. Last week we found out that the mask mandate along with the social distancing mandates were going to disappear, which would impact us for the first time on June 6th. You know, it disappears on the 2nd, but the 6th is our next worship service where we'll be together. Yesterday, while at a track meet, I found out that yet there was another change. So uh, that new change said anyone who has been fully vaccinated, meaning if you took a two-dose vaccine, you have both, both, both doses on board, uh, or a single dose vaccine, you've got the one, that anyone in that position could then take their masks off and stop social distancing immediately in the state of Ohio. Now, um, here's the thing. <laughs> to be vaccinated or not to be vaccinated is a very personal thing and something I don't believe that anyone should be compelled in any way to share with anyone else unless they want to. So Jennifer and I and Rebecca have been vaccinated. The other kids are not eligible at this point. That's a choice we've made. So by this mandate change, we could now not wear masks in public. Uh, but here's what I'm asking us to do, because I value the fact that vaccines, yes or no, are a personal decision. I wanna ask you to just keep wearing your mask until we hit that June 6th date. And then we all take them off together. All right. So I don't know if I'm bringing a burn barrel on that day or uh, we're going to... I thought about making a video of the things you can do with your mask now that you won't have to wear it anymore, uh, but I'm not sure that'll happen. So, But that's where we're going to go um, because to me, being together is much more valuable than wearing this thing for another couple of Sundays. So that's my spiel. Uh, there we go. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your immense love for us, for the fact that you left the glories of heaven, Jesus, to come to this earth in order to rescue us. Thank you for that. Thank you for taking that kind of initiative and uh, doing the amazing work of death on the cross for us. Bless us as we worship you today and help us to, to really enter in, not just to stand and sing some songs, but to really consider the words we are saying because you are a majestic, holy, and awesome God. Amen.
Each of us, Jesus was sent and died for us. Not because of what we have done, but because of who you are. You poured out your grace to each of us so that we can become a child of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So a number of years ago, about 15 years ago, we moved from Worcester to a house uh, just up by the airport 
And in the backyard, we have some trees. And when we moved in, we had trees, multiflora rose, and poison ivy. Those were the major crops that we had. And so Jennifer and I had done some getting rid of multiflora rose and getting rid of poison ivy, uh, which was not good for me, but uh, good for the property in long term. So one day, I was, uh, one Sunday, I was home after services and I looked out my window and my neighbors who are behind us, there's a road next to me, so they're behind us, they were working around their, around their mailbox area, where, where a mailbox would be, I should say, and they were doing some yard work. And so I wanted to warn them about, hey, there's a lot of poison ivy down here. So I left the house and I walked down the yard and I, I got down there and um, the wife said to me, oh, I, I know you're here to tell us we shouldn't work on Sunday. Folks, I didn't have my church clothes on. I didn't have my miter that I wear at home or the robe or the staff that I wear when I'm at, and I hold on to when I'm at home. I didn't have any of that stuff. And I'm like, first of all, I've never met you. Like, you know that I'm pastor of church, apparently, or you just think I'm uptight. I don't know, or both. <laughs> um, I said, actually, I came down to tell you that uh, there's a ton of poison ivy down here. Oh, 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 okay. So, and I said, and by the way, well, two things I want you to know. One, because there's poison ivy and you're doing this on Sunday, it's going to be twice as bad for you. <laughs> just want you to know that. <laughs> and the second thing I want you to know is I don't really spy on my neighbors about what they do on Sunday. I have to spend too much time spying on my church. So I have eight millimeter tape and beta and VHS and DVDs and now iMovies about all of you and I, I got dirt, so I'm, uh, I'm ready to go. <laughs> We got a passage to look at this morning in Mark chapter 3. It revolves around the Sabbath and what's okay to do on the Sabbath. It's another confrontation story between Jesus and the religious leaders of the day, which those are fairly frequently recorded in the Gospels. They are there for us to uh, understand what Jesus was driving at. So Mark 3, beginning in verse 1, says, Another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were there looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal the man on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill it? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Attitude, that's the first thing I want us to catch from this passage just three words today, attitude. Attitude is critical in our lives. It's critical to all the situations we find ourselves in. Let's say you need to repair something and in your mind you think to yourself, oh no, here we go again. Or I have no idea what I'm doing. I'll probably make it worse. I'm going to break it even more than it's already broken. Or I have no idea what I'm doing. That's attitude. That's what we roll in with. What if you go into the same situation you got something broken, you got to work on it, you think this is a great opportunity to learn something about electricity, right? Or it's a good opportunity to learn a new skill and it's some challenge, it's a puzzle to figure out, it's something that I'll get to think about for a while and eventually solve it, it'll be great. It's a totally different attitude which will lead to different outcomes. I want us to consider the importance of attitude, not just in life in general, but to faith in particular, the religious leaders in the day of Jesus were, I think, in an enviable position. They literally saw Jesus face to face. Now, we long for that. We get to spend eternity with him face to face in, in heaven. That's going to be great. But they got to see him then and there in the flesh. Uh, they got to see him teach. They got to listen to his teaching. They got to see him interact with people. They got to see him heal people. They got to see him do amazing things. And there they were face to face, but they really missed him. In the end of chapter two of Mark, Mark records some confrontational encounters with the religious leaders. In verse 18, it says, uh, how is it that John's disciples and the, disciple and the Pharisees are fasting and you are not? So it's a, an accusation. You guys aren't following the rules. What gives? You're not living up to our standards. You're not living up to our rules and regulations that we formed around the, the teaching of God. 
And then in Mark 20, or 2.23, Jesus' disciples are eating grain that they picked on the Sabbath, and they get accused of violating the Sabbath. You know, you're not living up to our Sabbath rules, what we do on uh, this holy day and what we don't do on this holy day, and we've laid it all out for you, and your disciples aren't paying attention to it. Now we're in chapter 3 of Mark, and we're at the synagogue. The synagogue is the place of teaching and worship and, and prayer for the Jewish folks. People from around the community are coming into these locations called synagogues, these teaching spots, these worshiping spots, in order to hear what God has for them. In, in many ways, it's like how we gather for church on Sunday morning, to teach and to worship. And uh, it, would, it would have been happening on the Sabbath, so Jesus is there in the synagogue. The religious leaders there are ready to accuse him. It says they came in looking to find fault. That's the attitude they have. Like, what's our attitude when we come to church on Sunday morning? Now, I have to tell you that as a pastor, when I get to go to other churches on a Sunday morning, it is very difficult for me to worship because I go into analytical mode Right? Driving the driveway and I think, oh, they should have cleaned that up before Sunday morning. That sign's terrible. It's way too long. The letters are too small. They're trying to say too much. Look at the bulletin. You think, why did they do that? Why didn't they say that? And then, because I don't know anything about music. I can't really critique that. Then the guy gets up to speak. And now I really got to restrain. Hey, you should have used Acts 6. That's a better passage for what you're trying to do. And I haven't done that yet. But I can't say I haven't thought those things. So the attitude I'm going in with is like I'm going to analyze this thing. And sometimes I see stuff. I go, oh, we should try that at church. Oh, we should try that at Smithville. That would be good, right? Is that the attitude of worship I should have when I enter? No. No. Not at all. But attitude matters. Attitude matters as we enter into worship. You know, we can look at the Sunday morning bulletin, look at the passage, and think to ourselves, I've heard all this before especially around Christmas and Easter, right? The story does not change, right? If Easter you're waiting for like Jesus didn't rise, it ain't gonna happen. It's like watching the Titanic and expecting him not to drown. It's not gonna happen. You can watch it 10 times. It's not gonna happen. I had a youth group uh, student one time tell me she watched it 10 times and he drowned every time. <laughs> yeah, huh? Yes, honey, that's how this works. <laughs> anyway, the attitude we come in. For me, what is tragic in this passage, it's absolutely tragic, is that the religious leaders and the Jewish people who were around, they got to see Jesus face to face, and yet they missed him. There he was, speaking to them, doing things in front of them, healing, uh, gathering groups, doing miraculous things, and they missed him. And they missed him in part because of their attitude. Folks, we have to watch for the same danger, that our attitude causes us to miss what God is doing. Right? We open up the Bible, and what do we expect? Do we expect to be entertained? Do we expect to be informed? How about we expect to be changed, confronted, challenged, encouraged? What we do in terms of our attitude, like what our attitude is going in to worship, to, to reading of the scriptures, to all sorts of things, uh, will cause us to have one outcome or another. A few years ago at National Conference, uh, they had a meeting. We always do this. We have multiple meetings of the National Brethren Elder Organization. So elders are pastors. So all the pastors get together and they have these meetings. And usually my attitude about these meetings is, oh, do I have to? But I go to them. Um, Okay, I mostly go to them. Uh, so go to this one recently, a couple years ago, and uh, the person gets up leading the meeting and says, we're gonna do an exercise. The hair on the back of my neck stands up. I'm beginning to think, stupid, dumb, this is gonna be ridiculous. And then he starts talking about, we're gonna send you out with a note card and, and, and we're gonna have you pray and ask God to give you a word. And I'm thinking to myself, he already did, it's right here, like, uh, what, what are we doing? And, and then now there's this pressure, like you have to go out. and the, You're not gonna share it with anyone, but you're thinking, well, so what does that mean if, if I don't get a word? And then I have this pressure, so I go outside and, and they send us off with these m minimal instructions and I go outside and I have to start to pray. But my prayer has to start though with, uh, Lord, my attitude's terrible. Which he already knew by the way, just a little clue. He already knew. 
Lord, my attitude is terrible. Uh, help me enter into this. And whatever you want to tell me, fine. But in the back, I'm still thinking it's not going to do it. I mean, anyway, so uh, that, that was my attitude going in. But I had to confess that and say, this is not the right, I should not take this attitude with it. And the word the Lord spoke to me is on a card on my bulletin board in my office to this day. Our attitude matters. When the religious folks showed up for the synagogue, some of them were there in order to find fault with Jesus, not to see God at work, not to hear from his word, not to be encouraged or supported or challenged, but only to find fault in him. And that was the attitude with which they entered in that moment. We want to make sure that our attitude is the appropriate one as we enter into worship and enter into all areas of our lives, right? Check our attitudes and see where we're at. Here's the second word I want us to think about, and that is commitment. Our attitude will shape the outcome of our lives as well as our commitments. In the account before us, the religious leaders are committed to their rules. The traditions of the elders, uh, which are this bubble wrap that I talked about a, a week or so ago, was sort of like this covering they put around the law of God to make sure nobody violated it. They wanted to protect it. It was precious. They wanted to preserve it. And so they put this wrapping around it of the rules with which you now had to follow to make sure you wouldn't violate the actual law of God. Our commitments shape us. There are days that I get up and I, uh, early in the morning and I drive from my place to Orville, Ohio, and I pull in right in front of one of my favorite places in Orville, Ohio, Michael's Donuts. And when you purchase something, you're making a commitment, right? Especially food, like there's no returns. You get that, right? It's not, I don't like it, it doesn't work. Anyway, uh, although sometimes in restaurants, but anyway, that's another story. Anyway, so I go in there and often what I'm buying is a dozen old fashioned donuts. Because in my humble opinion, those are the finest donuts that are produced in that place, perhaps in the entire world, okay? So, but sometimes the family talks me into, you should get cream sticks too, like get some old fashioned and some, so when I do that, I buy a peanut butter cream stick for myself and they all have their whatever they want, which are all terrible compared to what I want. That's how that works. But anyway, I'm committed to this peanut butter cream stick and I get home and I eat the peanut butter cream stick and every time I think to myself, it was good, but an old fashioned is better, right? Your commitments shape you. And if I spend a lot of time at Michael's, it's really gonna shape me, you know what I mean? It's the decisions we make, it's the commitments. Where I'm solidly committed to this thing or that thing, right? When uh, uh, coming up next week, I'm gonna marry a couple. So it's been on the schedule for a long time and I've committed to being there. Now, what if someone called me up and said, hey Art, let's go camping that weekend. Let's go shoe shopping that weekend, right? Let's braid our hair. And let's say I wanted to do those things, right? Some of them I would do. Um, I'll let you decide which ones. Uh, I'm growing her out here. Anyway, so uh, the commitment we make, right? A yes to the wedding is a no to other stuff. How about at the wedding? At the wedding, this couple's going to commit to each other in an exclusive relationship that should not have anybody else intertwined in it, right? Forsaking all others, right? So what if a husband at the, um, after the wedding ceremony says to the wife, oh, by the way, um, did you see Sally over at table six? Oh yeah, I did. Hey, we're going on a date after the honeymoon. <laughs> right, that's not gonna happen because <laughs> you won't be alive. Uh, Right? That's a commitment. It shapes our lives. We say, I'm with you in a way that I'm not with anyone else in the whole world. The religious leaders of the day are shaped by their commitment to this law that they have not created themselves, but have, been, have received. They've been, it's been passed down to them, and they are committed to that. A yes to that is a no to Jesus. Folks, we've got to pay attention to what we're committed to. Because if we're committing to things that are a yes to one thing and a no to Jesus, we are in deep trouble. But that's what's going on here. In this situation, Jesus doesn't shy away from it. Right? He doesn't say, well, I'll, uh, I know they're going to be kind of cranked at me if I heal this guy on the Sabbath, so I'm going to do it a little differently. You know, Jesus didn't grab the guy ahead of time and say, hey, I see your hands all messed up. Um, 
why don't you stay after the service and uh, we'll wait till everyone's gone and my disciples and I, we're going to help you out. He didn't say to him, hey, um, if you give me your address, my boys and I are going to swing by your house. We'll do this in private. Because Jesus isn't healing this man in order just to restore this man's hand, which is a great benefit to him. It's a blessing to him. It's 100% a a beautiful thing for him, but it's not just about him. He says to him in the passage, if if you read back again, he tells the guy, stand up. He's not hiding this. Stand up. And he knows the stubbornness of the hearts of the, 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 the Jewish folks who have arrived there at the synagogue. And he heals him in front of everyone to demonstrate that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. That he is in charge and that doing good on the Sabbath is a great thing. Right? The religious leaders may or may not have been okay with him healing. Later on he heals and they say, well he must be doing it by Satan's power. Uh, but in this case, they're worried about the, the day he's doing it, right? He's making a statement, right? I guess he could have also said to the guy, hey, you know, meet me tomorrow. Meet me tomorrow, then we'll do this. But, but he doesn't. He forces the issue. Stand up. We're going to do it right here. It's the Sabbath, which was a Saturday. But anyway, it's the Sabbath. Here we go. We're going to go ahead and get this on. We're going to make sure that your hand is healed, but we're going to also make sure that the religious people who are there are going to understand what I am doing. So then he asks the uh, religious leaders, he poses the question, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill it? And the religious leaders, it says, remained silent, which was probably wise because they didn't have a good option, right? If they said to do good, it's permission to heal, which violates in their mind their own law. If they say to do evil, they're endorsing evil. If they say to save life, kind of a permission again to heal. If they say to kill, that seems like the wrong thing to do on the Sabbath. And so they just remain silent. Jesus heals the man. And now the religious leaders are going to go away angry. They don't have good options from their perspective because they're committed to this application of the law that's been handed down to them that suggests to them what Jesus is doing is illegal (laughs) from a religious standpoint, right? So it's all laid out, by the way. It's fascinating kind of stuff. If you were, if you had an open wound, you could wrap it to cover it. That would be okay on the Sabbath, but you couldn't put ointment on it because that moved you into the work category, That's how law works when you start. You could walk to the synagogue and that would not be considered work if your walk was under one mile. Right? So you got to fit, well, we can't go to that one. We got to go to that one. We have to go to Second Baptist because First Baptist is a mile point two away and this is point eight. Did they have pedometers, by the way? I don't know what they were doing. Did they even measure in miles? But anyway, they had this rule, right? How far you can go. And count. So all this rule, and Jesus says, I'm going to blow a hole in that thing by raising this guy up in the service, and I'm going to heal his hand on the Sabbath. Final word, outcome. In the case of the Pharisees in this passage, the outcome of the situation is governed by their commitment and their attitudes. They're committed to the rules of the pre- previous religious leaders, and their attitude is to look for fault. So the outcome of this is, let's say, interesting or ironic, right? Jesus poses the question about doing good or doing evil, saving a life or taking a life. What's, what's lawful on the Sabbath? He does a miracle. He restores a man's hand, probably was injured during his lifetime, and he restores it. And in response to it, it says the religious leaders got together to plot to kill Jesus, Just think about that for a minute. They're mad at him because he's healing someone on on the Sabbath, but it's okay for them to gather together like a parking lot meeting and say, hey, guy, how are we going to kill this guy? That seems lawful on the Sabbath, doesn't it? It's ridiculous. But that's the way of lawmaking, and their commitment was so intense to their own law that they wouldn't see that as ironic or completely out of line. They break the law of God who doesn't want us to murder by spending time plotting to kill him. The outcome is related to their attitude and their commitment. And the reality is, the outcome is they miss Jesus. They see him as a fraud. They see him as a threat, like a threat to their power. And they fail to see that they're in the presence of the Son of God. 
Now, remember the disciples from last week? They're in the boat. Uh, Jesus comes walking on water. And then Peter uh, says, hey, let me come out. He goes out, and they're both walking on water. Then Peter sinks. Jesus saves him. They get in the boat, and the storm that's been a problem for them the whole evening calms immediately. And the response of the disciples is, it pushes them to their knees in worship. The Pharisees are not worshiping Jesus. They're looking for a way to kill him on the Sabbath. Now we know that in the sovereign will of God, the Pharisees are playing their part in a sense. Uh, Jesus is going to get crucified by the Romans and the Pharisees and other religious leaders are going to encourage that and kind of orchestrate that. But they are not doing it because they are following the will of God for themselves. They are doing it because they are personally threatened by Jesus. And this is the most tragic thing anyone can do to miss Jesus because of the stubbornness of their hearts. Because of the stubbornness of their attitudes. Look, folks say this about Jesus, that he was a good teacher, that all major world religions teach the same thing, that Jesus isn't the only way to God, that there are many ways to God. And there are all these things that, uh, that are po- tossed around and people say these things and then they are committed and kind of fixed to them. What they miss out on is the unique teaching of Jesus, that Jesus doesn't offer like some sort of cosmic comparison game where I get to say, well, I was in the top half of the world's population in terms of being a decent guy, right? He offers unmerited grace, right? In opposition to your record, in opposition to your deeds and your attitudes and your actions and your guilt before the Lord, I am going to forgive you. That's what Jesus offers us. Believing that God, that we can be somehow good enough and earn favor with God misses the truth of the gospel. We can be so committed to what is wrong, so committed to what is not in line with what is true, that we can miss Jesus. Or our attitude can be one of pride or arrogance. Hey, I know better. That we can miss Jesus. We can miss hearing Jesus when we enter into worship or open up his word or are involved in life and we're not paying attention and listening to the voice of God. The most tragic thing in this world is to miss Jesus. And so for the vast majority of us here in the room, we we haven't missed Jesus. We're trying to follow him and love him and serve him with our lives. And there's probably areas of our lives that we need to allow him to have more control over, to be sure. But how about the people who don't? Have, or have not accepted Christ at this point in their lives. They're in a perpetual motion of missing him. What are we going to do about that? What is our responsibility as the church, as the bearers of truth, of the heralds of the gospel? We need to be involved in people's lives that we can have enough credibility to share with them what it means to follow him because we do not want people to miss him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. That Jesus, you came from heaven to earth so that you could rescue us and that you could help us to then be a part of the rescue plan for all others. Help us to do just that so that we don't miss you and the people around us don't miss you so that we can see you clearly and follow you wholly. In Jesus' name, amen. Show.
continue to put our trust in you and you alone and to experience that not being shaken. Lord, there's things that happen in this world that are out of our control and come into our lives at unexpected times, but you are the solid, solid rock. Amen.